Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. It's open line first Monday, and our guest tonight is a returning Journey Home uh, guest, Dr. Jeffrey Schwem. He is a former Jehovah Witness. He'll be with you in just a moment to give a real quick summary of his journey, but you're the essential part of tonight's program. The, the purpose behind this open line program is to give you more of an opportunity to submit your questions, both by phone or email, to our guest tonight. And uh, as a former Jehovah Witness, uh, I know a lot of you have questions about the whole Jehovah, Jehovah Witness movement. So let me give you the phone numbers um, in, a, in a moment uh, because we want you to call as soon as we can. Um, uh, Jeff, uh, welcome to the Journey Home again. It's, it's great to have you back. here. And uh, uh, what we usually do in this segment is have you uh, give a quick summary of your journey to remind them of, uh, of your journey. And then in a moment, we'll give the phone numbers out and uh, want them to focus right now. But tell them a little bit about your journey home. Well, um, uh, my mother was a Missouri Synod Lutheran. My uh, father was a nominal Catholic. And when I was about five years old, my uh, mother uh, left the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and became a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I have uh, some vague memories of being a, a, a Missouri Synod Lutheran. I was baptized at uh, St. John Lutheran Church on Canal Boulevard in New Orleans. And then um, we left that church and then I became a, a Jehovah's Witness. I, we, I was raised that way, started going from door to door when I was six, gave my first presentation in front of the congregation which is known as a Kingdom Hall when I was eight. Uh, started speaking at um, conventions of Jehovah's Witnesses when I was 17. Um, I went from door to door full time as a, what they call a regular pioneer minister. Spent 100 hours a month going from door to door. And then I was invited to their world headquarters uh, where I served there for uh, one year, uh, which is where I met my wife, Kathy, <laughs> who um, is, uh, was actually raised Catholic and is a revert to the church. Um, to make a long story short, as you know, um, <laughs> took a, a five-year uh, break when we left the witnesses into um, the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, where I taught at a, a synodical school for the uh, Concordia University. And during those five years, started reading the early church fathers, as us converts tend to do, it seems, <laughs> and then decided it was time to come home to the fullness of the faith right. in the Catholic Church. So you had that journey from the Joel Witness into a more conservative Lutheran and then in the Catholic Church. Yeah. All right, now let me give you those phone numbers, and I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I've done this program eight years, and I'm always dependent on them. Give me the phone numbers. And we just forgot to put them up, so my stupid memory. Well, let me give them to you. 1-800-221-9460. And outside North America, 205-271-2980. And if you want to send me an email, you can do so at journeyhome at EWTN. Dot com. Now, once again, 1-800-221-9460. Jeff, um, uh, I was a Protestant for 40 years before I even considered the Catholic Church. And we were always around Jehovah Witness Kingdom Halls. There was always one in every town where we lived. There was always one kind of over there. <laughs> but I, I didn't grow up knowing very much about them. They might stop by the door. I remember often we'd see a car come up our driveway and it'd be full of people. And one would get out and hand us the slip and actually often didn't even want to talk, just wanted to give us the little magazine and then go. They did their duty, I guess. Mm -hmm. You're probably familiar with that little yes, act. Yes, I am. But w right off the bat, um, and I, I'm really priming the pump for your phone calls and emails, um, what would you say are the two most significant key theological quirks of the Jehovah Witnesses? I would say the first one um, that came, comes to mind for me is their chronology, their, their um, what we would call eschatology, their understanding of the end times and how that leads into the authority that their leaders uh, claim to have over the people who are members of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that um, in the year 1914 Jesus returned invisibly, inspected all of the churches of the world, and over a three and a half year period he, he did this, and then around 1918 chose the leaders of the Jehovah's Witnesses to be the, his official spokesperson, his official uh, reestablished true church on earth. And that uh, chronology is in big trouble right now, for one thing, um, for a variety of reasons. And also it's this authority structure uh, where a person who claims to speak for God, if you disagree with them, hmm. then who are you disagreeing with? That's a pretty outlandish claim. 
that somebody would say that that all happened to them, right? Mm -hmm. It was it the the people claim that this happened to them that started the movement? Well, actually, th this um, teaching kind of morphed over time. Uh, if you look at Russell's, um, uh, who, Ru Charles Russell, who started the movement in the 1870s, um, he actually, or he actually considered himself personally to be the faithful and discreet slave. Um, mm -hmm. and he called himself the angel of Laodicea, uh, which is an apocalyptic reference. Yep. And he talks about this um, in many of his books that uh, the, the dates that he set for the end of the world came from God through him mm -hmm. to the world. And, and then the whole religious system and the authority of this religious system is based on this uh, false sense of authority in many respects. There were a lot of these groups that started in this time period of the 1800s. Yes, yes, and, and that you go back in the uh, 1800s and many of them come out of the Millerite movement. Mm -hmm. um, Miller was a uh, pastor who in the 1840s uh, attempted to uh, predict the end of the world. Um, that's where you get what's known as the Great Disappointment of 1844, <laughs> which is where he predicted the end of the world in 1844 and didn't happen. And that's where the uh, Seventh-day Adventists come from. He tried it again in 1848 and it didn't work out then either. <laughs> and so most people, since it was sort of an interdenominational movement, went back to their different denominations, but others uh, continued on, and that's where you get the Second Adventists and then the Jehovah's Witnesses from that, and also the Seventh-day Adventists come from that movement as well. All right. I mean, you even hear a little bit of rumblings of some of the same things that were in Joseph Smith's Mormon movement. Oh, that's a little earlier, but same of the s same ideas. Correct, and then the same idea that once the last apostle died, the whole church went apostate, and then someone needed to be appointed by God to reestablish the true church on earth. And that's a common theme for all of these groups. Yeah. Well, it's scary to think about it because either, I suppose either one of two things, or maybe one of four things. Either God really spoke to these people. If he did, then we have a confusing God because he keeps giving different messages to all these different groups. Mm -hmm. Or number two, they're just completely deluded. Or they were demonically guided. Or they were liars. Well, they're... they're some interesting things um, when you go back and look at the early history of the Jehovah's Witnesses. For example, uh, the Witnesses, um, and they were actually known as Bible students at that time, had this great affection for what, what is known as pyramidology, and that's an occultic thing. Um, and there's actually certain New Age type groups uh, that are into what's known as pyramid power that can trace some of their history back to Charles Russell. And most Jehovah's Witnesses would be totally clueless about that history. Okay. And what, what, another major theological I quirk? I would say the other major theological quirk is that they're um, neo-Aryans in the sense that they deny the divinity of Christ. And really, that's a central doctrine. Um, when we look at historic Christianity, the goal for all Christians is to participate in the life of the Trinity. I mean, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for being in heaven for all eternity and participating in this life. Uh, of the Trinity, and if you don't believe in the Trinity, well, what's your goal? And there's a lot of other things that fall apart because they get this Christology wrong. In fact, that's an interesting part of your journey. It had something to do with this book in front of you, right? Yes, yes, excellent. Tell that. I think that's interesting. Well, um, years ago when I was um, reading lots of different books and I had lots of questions about, well, is Jesus God? And you were a Jehovah's Witness at this point? I was leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses. Oh, okay. I, was, I was still going to the Kingdom Hall periodically. What I would do is um, I would buy books, pro and con, for the Trinity. And I bought this book uh, by Dr. Robert Morey, known as The Trinity, Evidence and Issues. And it went from, through the Old Testament and the New Testament and collected scriptures for the evidence of the Trinity. And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to use just the New World Translation by itself, which is the Jehovah's Witness translation of the Bible, and see if I can find a reason for the Trinity you know, the, how someone could come up with this. And what happened was I found some very interesting contradictions that I could only solve by believing in the Trinity doctrine. And so it was, it's kind of ironic that the New World Translation led me to belief into the, in the Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> Which again is the wonderful, merciful work of the Holy Spirit. We, we do have a couple emails that are getting ready here. Before we go to one though, I'd like to ask, um, um, we've looked at some theological quirks. What would you say are the, the one or two key um, enticing aspects of Jehovah Witness movement that pull Catholics and other Christians into the Jehovah Witness churches? 
the hope for, the, and we talked about this when I was on the program last time, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses have this two-tiered system of salvation where 144,000 people will live forever and, uh, with Jesus and uh, rule with Him. But the vast majority of people will live forever in paradise on earth. And when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, they have these beautiful pictures of paradise, people who look nice, great food, the whole works. And I think what happens is it's very easy, particularly in a culture like ours, where the focus is so much on materialism, to be very comfortable with a hope like that. Because mm -hmm. when you look at someone who is a Christian, and I told this story before when I was on the program, I once went to the door and this gentleman, and I asked this gentleman, would you like to live forever in paradise on earth? And he said, no, because when I die, I'm going to heaven to be with Jesus, and there's no better place to be <laughs> than there, including a paradise earth. Yeah. Well, I had no, no comeback for that because he's right in a spiritual sense. Yeah. Most people, if they're poorly catechized, have no idea what heaven's going to be like, but they sure know what a nice lawn looks like, what a nice meal looks like, mm. what a nice house looks like. And I think that's very enticing to people, and that helps get them in. All right. Let's take our first email. This comes from Daniel in Salinas, California. He writes, hello, Marcus and guests. Some Jehovah Witnesses have told me that the true name of God is Jehovah and not Yahweh. Is this true? How should I respond to this statement? Thanks, Daniel, for your email. Well, um, it's ironic. We were just talking about this tonight. Uh, what, what happened is um, back in, and I can't remember the exact date, uh, the Tetragrammaton, which are the four consonants of the divine name. Uh, which is what you would take Yahweh. Right. Uh, well, what, what happened was in the Old Testament, right. you would find these four consonants. Mm -hmm. And the Jews felt like the name was so holy they, they couldn't pronounce it. So what they did is they put the vowel markings for Lord in between to remind the Jewish persons not to speak the divine name but to say Lord instead. Okay. Well, what happened was a Catholic monk, monk, if I'm not mistaken, transliterated that and what you get is Jehovah. Okay. Uh, most of the research now says that um, you have, um, they probably said Yahweh and that's probably the best translation of the divine name and Jehovah's not as good. I don't really get into that argument with them. <laughs> I, I, I kind of say w whatever one that you're comfortable with is fine with me. So I don't really make an issue of that too much. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think we're going to have a caller already, Lorraine, Lorreen from Illinois. Lorraine, what's your question tonight? I want to know, do uh, Jehovah's Witness have um, salvation if they don't believe in Jesus? All right, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Would a Jehovah's Witness have salvation if they don't believe in Jesus? Um, well, their Jesus is a different Jesus, okay? So their Jesus is Michael the Archangel. He, when he was on earth, he was a mere man. And what he did was he um, died on not even a cross, but a stake to pay for the sin of Adam. So they believe in Jesus in that sense. They have this understanding of a, uh, a ransom sacrifice, um, but it's not the same Jesus that we have, and so of course, I would say that that puts their salvation in danger because they're going after a Jesus yeah. that is not the historic Christian uh, Jesus. Yeah. It's not the historical Christ. Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll just a word to that. On the one hand, uh, the church emphasizes that we trust in God's mercy for those who are truly invincibly ignorant. In other words, their lack of the gift of faith is no fault of theirs mm -hmm. because they weren't told. So then we leave that to God's mercy. But that understanding never takes away from our responsibility to go tell them because we don't want to leave them in that invincible ignorance. And, and the, 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 um, what always makes me think about that is when I came into the church, I accepted as my patron saint, um, Saint Isaac Jokes, mm -hmm. the Jesuit uh, missionary martyr who went to the, to the Canadian Indians, the Huron Indians, who were invincibly ignorant right? But he gave his life to tell them the truth, to not leave them in their invincible ignorance. And so that's why today we can't presume on, on the mercy of God. We're called to go out and tell. Well, I'm always reminded of what the little flower says, and that is, she always says, I want to receive all there is that God wishes to give me. And I, I say the same thing to my Jehovah's Witness friends uh, many times when this comes up and say, I wish to share with you all that God has shared with me. Yep. When we think about 
how sh we should feel towards the Jehovah Witnesses live next door. Well, we, we feel sorry for them. They're caught up in this truncated gospel, twisted gospel. Um, but God so loved the world that he sent his only son for them too, you know? Yes. So we want them to know about that Absolutely. and the fullness of that. Absolutely. Right. Okay, let's go to the next email. This comes from Mary Catherine, Virginia. She writes, Dear Journey Home, I had a friend in grade school who was a Jehovah Witness and he never had birthday parties. As well, he was not allowed to attend and celebrate friends' birthdays. Why exactly are witnesses not allowed to celebrate birthdays or any other secular holidays? Thanks, Mary. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that celebrating birthdays is to engage in a form of preacher worship. And so... It, oh, creature worship. Yeah, creature worship. So when you have a birthday for someone, what you're doing is you're worshiping that person. That's what they believe. Um, there's also other things to it, too. Uh, if you go back to in the history, uh, there was a time period when J.F. Rutherford was the leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and it was around that time that they started putting all these bands on, you can't do Christmas or birthdays and holidays and things like that. And I think much of that had to do with the fact that he was doing everything he possibly could to separate the Witnesses from mainstream society and also from the other uh, denominations and churches. It's, it's a harsh word to drop on any religion, but what you just described sounded like it was taking more and more on of a cultic nature. Oh, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Uh, and we talked about that a little bit last time when we were here. When you look at a cult, a cult is a group that engages in certain uh, procedures and techniques to keep people away from the full story, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, so that it's harder for them to make an informed decision in certain aspects in their life. Mm -hmm. And then also cults tend to be very insular when they are um, um, except for when they're pr proselytizing. Right. They tend to be very insular and it's very hard for cults to support an entire culture. When you look at the Catholic Church, I mean the Catholic Church and its teachings, social teachings included, are the basis for Western civilization. Yeah. A cult could never ever do anything like that. Yep. Okay, very good. Our next caller, Dorothy from Pennsylvania. Hello Dorothy, what's your question? Hello, uh, uh, thank you for taking my call. My question is for Dr. Swim. I'd like to know why his, his mother converted from Lutheranism to Jehovah's Witness. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, it was an interesting time period in her life. What happened was um, I was around five years old, and my grandmother, her mother, passed away. And it was a very, she was very close to her mom. And it was a very um, painful time for her. And, and that's also a common element in many conversions is that people are, enter these particular types of groups many times when they're going through a major change in life or it could be a divorce, a loss of a mate, loss of a, of a parent and things of that nature. Another thing too was that about the time, I'd say it was probably less than a year that my grandmother passed away, her best friend from high school had just recently converted to the witnesses and showed up at the door. And so that gave, instantly gave the witnesses some credibility as well. Mm -hmm. And then my father followed and then my grandparents followed and they were actually nominally Catholic. And so I think another part of it too is, is poor catechesis, poor understanding of what the mm -hmm. church really teaches and what it was they had to begin with. All right, that just reminds us, every one of us, to make sure our children know the central core aspects of our Catholic faith. And then we, all of us never presume that we've arrived, we've always got to keep growing and examining and learning our faith so that we can be a good witness uh, for our church and our God. Let's take our next email. This comes from uh, French from Georgia. Uh, and she writes, Dear Journey Home, why does the Jehovah Witnesses, Witness Church have a different Bible than ours? Gloria and Ecclesia Deo. Thank you, French. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses have the New World Translation, which I have a copy of right here. <laughs> um, the reason why it's different is that they've gone to great pains to remove references to the divinity of Christ. And that's what... Uh, now, well, how did they do that? Did they literally change the word or they use footnotes to explain it away or... Well, a combination of the two in many cases. Uh, one of the things they do is they like to insert the divine name, Jehovah, into places in the New Testament where it really shouldn't belong, and that confuses the identity uh, of whether it's talking about Christ or God the Father. Um, some of their, uh, what they'll do is also they'll take a very, um, they'll take a position on certain translation 
issues that's in the very, very, very small minority and use that as an excuse to, to change the way the Bible is. John 1.1 1, 1 would be an example. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a real key one there. Mm -hmm. um, what did they do with the Holy Spirit and what did they do with the apostolic church? I mean, did they just say it broke away really fast? And yes. When the last apostle died, it all went apostate. So when the last apostle died, it was going apostate even before then, but when the last apostle died, the church went apostate. And there may have been pockets of people here and there that were faithful, but it wasn't reestablished until Charles Russell came along. The ironic thing is that many times <laughs> they'll choose different groups that the Catholic Church, quote unquote, persecuted, and say that they may have been the remnant that eventually like led to. Yeah, exactly. Group, yeah. The problem, though, is that none of those guys taught what the witnesses teach today. <laughs> so I don't know why they would say that, but that's what they do. And what about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is a force, like electricity, not even a person. Um, so the Holy Spirit is like electricity that. that so God when uses. the force be with you, kind of a thing, is uh, very, very Jehovah Witnessy. Right? Yeah, and then there's other things too. <laughs> like for example, there's some problems if you go back to the, the um, their book that they used to use in their field service ministry called "You Can Live Forever in Paradise on Earth." They actually speak of God as having a body, which is totally outside of the realm yeah. of historic Christian understanding. Because if someone has a body, then what? He's got to be in some space and yeah. time. Yeah. So then God, in some sense, it implies he's subject to time, and he's not outside of time. The Jehovah's Witness God is very, very puny <laughs> in many respects. Not to be mean, but that, that's what happens when you leave. And again, it's different views, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, across the board, and Jehovah's Witness, mm -hmm. uh, amongst Jehovah's Witness followers. In fact, there isn't just one Jehovah's Witness church, right? Well, there's um, the Jehovah's Witnesses who are part of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Um, but there are numerous splinter groups. There's a book this thick that you can get, and I can't remember the author's name, but it's an anthology of groups that have come off the Watchtower Society, basically we call the Russellite movement. And there's just tons of these groups all over the place. There's a large group of what's known as Chicago Bible students in uh, Chicago, and you can get all of Russell's old writings from them. They still believe in many of the old doctrines that Russell teach. So some of them could come across as sounding like just regular evangelical Protestants, but uh, um, alluring. Yeah, those, those people would tend to be less um, focused on an organization being the official spokesperson and more of a, a me and Jesus almost type of uh, theology. All right. Well, let's take a, a quick break. When we get back, our first caller will be Mary from from Missouri. We'll come back to you in a moment, though. So, see you in a bit. Welcome back. Jeff, before we go on, I want to tell the audience about your website. It's a brand new website, right? CatholicXJW.com. It's not a new car. It's CatholicXJW.com. <laughs> what would they find if they went to that website? Uh, they'll find conversion stories. Um, one of the things is that I've been contacted in the past by people who have left the witnesses and are interested in the Catholic Church and think they're the only person in the world who's ever been attracted to the Catholic Church after leaving the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. And that's not true. There's, there are many former Jehovah's Witnesses who are now Catholic. Because you mentioned right after you did the program, all of a sudden people are coming oh, out of the yeah, walls, right? They're coming there. out of the woodwork. Yeah. Um, and then, so there's articles about conversion stories, which I know many people like. Uh, there's also articles on how do I dialogue with Jehovah's Witnesses on different doctrinal topics. And there's also some general articles on the different teachings of the Catholic faith and resources such as that. All right, great. Let's go to our next caller, Mary from Missouri. Hello, Mary, what's your question? Hello. Um, my husband has been trying to get into the witnesses for about a year and a half now, and I'm a cradle Catholic. And by God's grace, he's letting me raise the kids Catholic at the moment. Mm. Um, he has not been baptized yet, but I'm having a real hard time. I come to him with um, their ideologies and how they are very flawed and their, um, their 
predictions that never came true and what have you. And I was just wondering, what was it that created your doubt finally in uh, the Watchtower that got you to see that they weren't the all-powerful organizations they claimed to be? Thank you, Mary. And our prayers are with you, all right, because yes. we know the struggle that you're in, uh, in the intimacy of that. So thank you, Mary. What was really powerful for me was reading their history and looking at their older literature. And it's very difficult to get people who are active Jehovah's Witnesses to look at the older literature because they're discouraged from doing so uh, for obvious reasons. Because when you look at the old literature, what you discover is that um, the way in which the Jehovah's Witnesses explain away their false prophecies doesn't hold any water. Um, you also have to be careful as to how you uh, present that material to your husband. Um, I know the temptation, particularly being married, is to say, see, look, 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 you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. You, you need to um, maybe ask things more in the form of a question. With the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they're trained to teach others, and you can use that to your advantage by saying, you know, I don't understand what it is about the Jehovah's Witnesses that is attracting you to that. Can you explain it to me, what it is? And use that, and many times from that you can understand how it is that, that person has been drawn in, what his issues are, and then use that to determine how you might uh, approach that person in dealing with those issues in a, in a loving way. You, you always want to um, approach people uh, where they are, just like God always approaches us where we are, and you also always want to pray. The number one thing that you can do for any Jehovah's Witness is pray for them. Um, my Aunt Maxine started a prayer group in her Lutheran church when my mom became a Jehovah's Witness back in 1975. And that prayer group met once a week from 1975 till she passed away in, I believe, 1996. And the purpose of that prayer group was to pray that before she died, she would see at least one of her Jehovah's Witness relatives leave that and come home. And guess what happened? Oh. And so I always encourage people who are in your situation to pray, get a prayer group started at your church. Eucharistic adoration is extremely powerful in these circumstances. Go to Eucharistic adoration, pour your heart out to the Lord about the situation your husband is in. Is there a good book you recommend? A very good book is Jason Everett's book from Catholic Answers. Uh, I think it's called um, Catholic Answers to Jehovah's Witnesses or something of that nature. Uh, that's a very good book. Of course, you can find my website and also you can get in contact with me via email and right. uh, I'll do what I can to help. All right, Mary, and I want everyone listening to say a brief prayer for you and for your, and your marriage and the struggle that you're experiencing because of that div division in your, your religious life. Uh, and I, my guess is there are a few others watching the program probably have the same issue. We keep you all in our prayer. Let's go to the next, take this email. This comes from Lee, dear Marcus and guest. Why is it that Jehovah Witnesses believe only, now, he writes 322,000 people will go to heaven. I think it's 144,000. 144,000. Uh, we have millions of Jehovah Witnesses in the whole world. Does it mean the rest will not go to heaven? Why be in a church that does not guarantee heaven? Thanks, Lee. Well, it's like what we were talking about before. They have this two-tiered system of salvation where they believe 144,000 people. Which comes from? Uh, Revelation 14. They take uh, a scripture in Revelation, the first verse, they take it very literally, um, and they believe that 144,000 people will uh, go to heaven and rule forever uh, with Christ on earth, um, with Christ in heaven, and then the rest of the Jehovah's Witnesses will live forever in paradise on earth. And again, why would someone be attracted to that? I, I think it's this materialistic aspect. M many people are raised in a nominally Christian home and you know we're taught the American dream and we live in a society that's very materialistic and I think that particular type of hope appeals to people. You know, uh, uh, and of course some people have uh, a strange Hollywood view of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. White cloaks with little uh, yeah. feathery wings, you know, playing harps. Yeah. Or you'd be down here with golf carts and <laughs> have a great time in this beautiful paradise. Right. Yeah, yeah. so why do you think they're going to pick them? That's right. <laughs> Let's go to our next uh, caller, Larry from Florida. Hello, Larry. What's your question? Hello, Larry. Are you there? Or maybe why they're trying to find him. I asked you another question because um, earlier you mentioned this issue about the Trinity and the issue of the force. I'm going to go back to that issue of the force and the Holy Spirit. 
does every Jehovah Witness believe that they have within them this force the way we believe we have the Holy Spirit within us? Or is it just 144,000 that are blessed with this added forth force? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> last time I was on your program, we talked about that scripture in Romans 8, 17 that talked about um, how, how all who have God's Spirit are children of God yep. and heirs. They apply that primarily to the 144,000. The Je Jehovah's Witnesses believe that the 144,000 are spirit begotten sons of God, which sounds very, very Christian. Hmm. Uh, the, those of the earthly calling are considered to be friends of God, and they sort of ride the coattails of the leadership. In fact, I was told once when I was considering leaving that if I left the organization, I would lose the Holy Spirit. So to, to have the Holy Spirit, you had to be connected yeah. to what they actually call the Spirit-directed organization, which is the Jehovah's Witness Again, all, Church. All, all very cultic sounding mm -hmm. and, and a lot of these approaches to the way they control their membership. And also they believe a little bit of holy deception, don't they? I mean, what's that? In, holy deception, in other words, this idea of only uh, guarding a, a certain part of the truth and only letting a, a certain oh. amount that'll be known as they evangelize. Yes. You gotta come in to, to know, you can't know the rest of it until you come in. And right, because it. what happens is as you, it's a, it's a stage process as you agree, 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 and then they ha ha hooked you into that hope, then that's when they get you with all the blood transfusion and things and some of the more bizarre issues. And the responsibilities to be going out. And going from door to door, that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Let's take our next caller. This comes from uh, Joanne in Canada. Hello, Joanne. What's your question? Hi, Marcus. Hello. Um, I work for a Jehovah Witness, and one of my concerns is one of his comments is in the New World Translation, which came out, I think, in the 1950s and was revised in the 1980s, uh, they changed the wording. Our scripture says the word was with God and the word was God, and in their scripture it says the word was with God and the word was a God. Can you explain to me how I can understand where their error is in this? Thank you, Joanne. That's an important question because that's a, a very significant central issue. Sure. Uh, there's a couple of things you can do. One is I would uh, get a copy of the Kingdom Interlinear Version of the scriptures. And interlinear is where they have the actual Greek text and then they have the translated uh, text on the side. And, and in the the Kingdom Interlinear Version is the interlinear for the New World Translation. And what they have this is, is their, their, this is their document. Their, okay, yeah. okay. Now what they have is they have what's known as the Westcott and Hort Greek text with the word for word translation underneath it on one side of the page. And then on the other side of the page they have the New World Translation. And you can use that and clearly show that the Greek text does not line up with what they have in the New World Translation. It's very easy to do. And actually if you get in touch with me at the website I'll help you do it, <laughs> okay. okay? And I may be able to get you a copy if, if you have a hard time getting it from the witnesses because they're kind of hard to come by sometimes. <laughs> Another thing to do is <clears throat> you can, um, and we were actually talking about this tonight, you can go through the New World Translation and look at situations where Jehovah in the New World tra Translation will say things like, um, I created the world, it was me and only me, I did it by myself, and these sorts of things. And if you look at John 1, 3, it clearly states that nothing was created outside of the agency of Christ. So if Jesus is not Almighty God, hmm. and Jehovah, God the Father, is some separate God, you yeah. have a, a major yeah. contradiction in, in Scripture. And so you can do that, and, I, and I, it can also help you with that. There's another argument that has to do with a basic grammatical Correct. thing. Now, they just blow that off? No, no, no. They take a minority opinion. And one of the things, too, that they misunderstand. Might you want to tell them what I'm talking about there? Um, there's, um, and I'm not a Greek scholar, but there's a, a way in which you can translate John 1.1 1, 1, where you can put the A God in there. Yeah. And there's a rule, and I can't remember the name of the rule. And, yeah. I don't want to like have okay. your eyes glaze over okay. on me. <laughs> okay. But you can get into that argument with the witnesses. Um, I don't find it to be all that effective uh -huh. in many cases unless the person just likes to argue Greek grammar. Right. Um, another thing that you can do is, I think what's more powerful is to uh, look at these contradictions that you see in the New World Translation right. if the Trinity is something that's um, not true. Okay, very good. Let's go to this next email. This uh, is from Kevin in Toronto, dear Marcus and Dr. Schwimm. Being a doctor, I have always found it odd that the witnesses refused blood transfusion as Christ did away with the old law. 
on the consumption of blood and other dietary habits as it was in the Old Testament. Why do they see blood transfusion as consumption of blood and isn't it more important to say the life of a man, woman, or child? This seems to me to be similar to euthanasia. Thanks, Kevin. Um, that's a very good question. What they do is they take Acts chapter 15 where they have a prohibition on what's really the eating of blood as you point out and then they extend that to saying that um, blood transfusions are the same as eating blood. Um, what I usually point out to them and, and I ask them if you know is uh, having a kidney transplant the same as eating a kidney? You know it just it doesn't make sense. Um, and there's also some other things that you can uh, point out to them. There's actually a physician in Oregon who works with a group known as the Associated Jehovah's Witnesses for Reform on Blood. It's a group of anonymous active witnesses who are trying to put pressure on the Jehovah's Witnesses to change this doctrine. And they have a website. <laughs> and um, they point out many of the inconsistencies in the doctrine. And many of the things that they point out are quite powerful. For example, uh, back in the 1970s, they wrote a book called Jehovah's Witnesses and the Question of Blood. And in this book, they, ex they, ha they spend a, an inordinate amount of time trying to convince the reader that modern day medical scholarship believes that having a blood transfusion is the same as eating blood. And they quote this doctor. What they don't tell the reader is that the doctor they're quoting practiced medicine in the 16th or 17th century. <laughs> and wrote this only a couple of years after the circulatory system was discovered. And so yeah. the scholarship is very, very bad in yeah. most cases as it is with groups such as this. And demonstrating that to a witness can be very powerful. All right, thank you, Jeff. Let's go to the next caller. This is Carol from Colorado. Hello, Carol, what's your question? Hi, Marcus and doctor. Uh -huh. Hi. I have a son in Italy that married an Italian girl who I was so happy because I thought they would, she would be a Catholic girl. Unbeknownst, she was Jehovah Witness. Mm. My son started studying the Bible, and then he stopped because he had an American flag in the back of his window. They do not believe in flags. His father-in-law got very mad. And then the, I went over in October. The question came up. Um, why, who is Jehovah to Jesus? Jehovah Ooh. is Jesus' brother. Hmm. How can that be? All right, thank you. Um, Does that sound familiar? Is no, it, it doesn't actually. That sounds like more like Mormonism to me. Oh, okay. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely true that the Jehovah's Witnesses would um, not salute the flag. I mean, they, they tend to be... Um, politically neutral, they're not allowed to vote, and those sorts of things. Um, again, uh, what you can do, visit my website. I have an article on how you might discuss the Trinity uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, there's some interesting scriptures you can use using the New World Translation. In fact, I'm wondering if this uh, next email, I might do this, because this might go right along with your answer here. Okay. This comes from Christy in Illinois. She says, I had two Jehovah's Witnesses knock on my door recently. What three or four things might I say to them that would really, really, she wants to know the silver bullet, uh, <laughs> make them stop and listen and perhaps consider, turn their heads around their beliefs as it compares to the Catholic faith. Also, when I told them I was Catholic, it seemed they couldn't leave fast enough. <laughs> Why would this be? Thank you, Kathy. Well, I would say that a, a Catholic who really knows their faith um, and can really express it very well will, will make a very powerful impression on the Jehovah's Witnesses. I have a friend of mine who... Um, does this, um, he, uh, he's a cradle Catholic, knows his faith very well, and the Jehovah's Witnesses have actually said to him that if I knew more Catholics like you, I might consider becoming Catholic. Hmm. And so um, you can make a very powerful impression on these people. There's no silver bullet other than prayer. Yeah. Pray for them. You're, you know, you're, you're St. Francis said, uh, evangelize always and when necessary use words. So sometimes words are necessary, and many times they are necessary when a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door. But you're not going to debate someone into the faith. You pl you're a seed planter. Plant the seeds. The Lord makes them grow. He, might not, he probably won't make them grow on your doorstep. <laughs> but 10 years from now, you might be looking at know. a Catholic brother or sister, a Christian brother or sister, who has come home. Um, so the magic bullet is prayer, in a sense. Yeah. 
because it's always grace, right? Mm -hmm. It's grace working in our hearts. Let's go to our next caller, Angie from Delaware. Hello, Angie. What's your question tonight? Hi. I just first and foremost, I wanted to, uh, you know, say God bless you both, and I, I really appreciate what Dr. Jeffrey's doing. Um, I am a former Jehovah's Witness. Oh, I'm only 24 home. right now. I was disfellowship when I was 19, and it's just been a mess. I want to ask for your prayers. I really, I love your station. Um, me and my grandma and my listen watch the Divine Chaplet, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy every day, and uh, I just wanted to ask for your prayers for my family because each and every one of them is Jehovah's Witness, and you know, I, I've been thinking about getting baptized Catholic, and I, I guess I, I'm just wondering what my next step should be. You know, it's 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 been a rough journey, and I'm right. kind of confused. You know. Angie, thanks so much for calling. In fact, I'm asking everyone who's watching to pray for you and as you go through the discernment process and welcome home, but I know you're still on the journey. It's like a one-time thing, it's, it, especially if you've been a part of a group like this, even after you convert, you still got baggage you're dealing with, right? Oh, absolutely. You'll have baggage, you know, for quite a long time. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. The Lord forms us in many different ways and our experiences He uses for good. Yep. And the experiences you're going through right now, although you, you, it sounds like you're going through some suffering, uh, will be used by God for good to assist others in the journey. Uh, I'll pray for you. Get in touch with me at the website. We'll do what we can to help you. I would say the next step is to look for a priest to, that uh, if you feel comfortable with uh, speaking to him or about the uh, journey and uh, looking at maybe an RCIA program in your, in your local area, um, contact me at the website and uh, we'll be happy to assist you in that journey. All right, thank you. Let's go now to Trish in Ohio. Hello, Trish, what's your question? Hi, good evening, Jeff. Hi, Marcus. Hey. Hello. I was wondering if this, okay, I believe you said 1914, correct? Yes. Okay, so in 1914 then, what happened to all these people's ancestors? I mean, babies were just left and, I mean, what happened, do they think, to their ancestors and the people before them? Well, it's, it's it's a good question. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses kind of believe in sort of a second chance doctrine. What happens is all the people who um, die and are invincibly ignorant of, of the truth that the Witnesses believe they have, um, uh, when they die they're in eternal or they're in a non-existent state. Jesus comes, he destroys all the non-Jehovah's Witnesses and then during this period as they're working their selves back to perfection, they believe that Jesus is going to resurrect these invincibly ignorant individuals, probably mostly those who lived in between the um, death of the last apostle and the time that Charles Russell came along. And those people will be trained to become Jehovah's Witnesses during that 1,000 year reign. So they sort of have a um, second chance doctrine in that sense. All right. Okay, very good. Um, let's see. Let's go to our next caller, Phyllis from Michigan. Hello, what's your question? Thank you for taking my call. I was wondering, is it true that Jehovah's Witnesses have to have a password to get into heaven? And if they do, where do they get the password from? All right, <laughs> thanks, Phyllis. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> they didn't give me the password. Well, that's, that's interesting because, I mean, would some not trained very well in Jehovah Witness theology. Maybe that's a sarcastic comment, but if the 145,000 got the secret in, I mean. I, I have no. no idea, never heard that But before. there was a previous caller that also said, you know, whose, whose, daughter, whose son had married a daughter in Italy and they had kind of a strange view too. I mean, is this just one of the many variants out there? It could be, it could be, I, I, don't, I don't really know. What, what's interesting is that um, the Jehovah's Witnesses believed um, that before 1935, God was primarily looking for people to join the 144,000. And then in 1935, Rutherford came along and said, those positions have been predominantly filled, and now we're gonna start looking for people to live on paradise on earth. That's interesting. And so that's why you have, so. most of the people who claim to have the heavenly calling are advanced in age. And actually there's a social pressure, as there is in most groups that are, tend to be cultic, that if you're very young and you claim to be of the 144,000, they believe you're trying to become a prominent person and you're doing it for the glory and that sort of thing. And so they discourage that from happening. Now, of course, a part of this was that, that the founders of this believed that the end times was happening like right now. Correct. So the idea they have 144,000 
they didn't think about the possibility that we're going to have to worry about this issue for the next hundred years because... Well, there's some of that. Uh, if you go back to Russell, though, Russell believed that there were actually two sections to heaven and the 144,000 were sort of in a higher section and then the, the rest of the people were sort of in a lower section of heaven. And then Rutherford took that next step and said, well, these, the southern group of people are going to live forever in paradise on earth. Okay. So, all right, let's go with uh, Diana in New Jersey. Hello, Diana, what's your question? Hello, Marcus. Uh, thank you for having me on, and I welcome your uh, guest. My question has to do with their memorial service, which they celebrate once a year at Easter time. Now, let's go back to where they believe that Jesus is the uh, Archangel Michael. Mm -hmm. So why are they celebrating the Passover or the Supper uh -huh. of Christ at that particular time? Great. And why good. just once a year? Very good question. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that since the Passover was celebrated once a year, therefore their communion service should be celebrated once a year. Another thing, too, is that um, they have uh, the concept of the sacramental nature of things is totally foreign to a Jehovah's Witness. So for them, the bread and the wine uh, are bread and wine and they're just symbols. Purely symbol remembrance. Purely symbols. And then the only people who partake of it are those who have the heavenly calling. Uh, the other people who are there who are of the earthly calling simply pass the bread or the wine to the next person. So in most cases when you go to a, a, a memorial service, no one partakes. Well they're all dead, right? The first 144,000 well, are long since yeah. gone. Well you have six million witnesses and then the Jehovah's Witnesses count how many people partake and on average only about seven or eight thousand people a year partake. So they're old folk, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the leftover from the first 144,000. Yes, sir. A few yeah. remaining folk. Mm -hmm. That's it, really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, let's go with Lynn in Maryland. Hello, Lynn. What's your question? Hi. Thank you so much for your show. I appreciate it a great deal. I just joined the Catholic Church last Easter vigil. Welcome home. And uh, I was a member of a more of a liberal Mormon church. And I appreciate your guest remarks a great deal. I was wondering, what is a service like in the Jehovah's Witnesses? I've, I've never been in one of the Kingdom Halls. I take it they don't take communion every Sunday. Is it a homily-based uh, service? Do they have candles or um, the beautiful things that we see in our parishes? Thank you, Lynn. So the few remaining 144,000 get to sit inside the church and the rest are out in the front porch? Or <laughs> the no, that doesn't really happen that way. Um, what happens is on Sundays they, they generally have a two-hour service where the first hour they'll have uh, an elder, uh, either one from that particular congregation or a visiting congregation, who will give a 45-minute lecture on some topic. And they actually get outlines from the headquarters that they follow for those. Mm -hmm. And then the second hour, usually on the Sunday afternoon, is they'll study a um, article in, in the Watchtower, which is the main journal that they use. During the week, they have what's known as the Congregation Book Study, where they study a book published by the Jehovah's Witnesses. Most of those meetings are in the homes of people uh, in the, in the um, congregation. And then usually on Thursday evenings, they'll have what's known as the Theocratic Ministry School, where they train Jehovah's Witnesses to um, publicly speak and to defend their faith. And then they have what's known as a service meeting where they train people to go from door to door and get the literature into the hands of the people. Um, there's no candles, um, no windows usually in, in Kingdom <laughs> Halls either, not sure why. Um, and there have some pictures on the wall, um, not a whole lot of what I would say beautiful artwork. It looks like a meeting hall. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a break, but um, quickly, uh, was there any element of the rapture beliefs in their theology? Um, you, you see more similarities to the rapture belief uh, during Russell's time period. Mm. As time goes on, um, while they're still millennialist in that sense, um, the rapture is something that they would, would deny and, and would argue with uh, evangelicals. But they were kind of being formed about that same time mm -hmm. period when the whole rapture yes, idea correct. arose. But they sort of progressed away from that. Okay. Let's take a break and we'll be back just a moment with some final words from the journey home.
Welcome back. Jeffrey, we know from emails and phone calls that uh, Jehovah Witnesses watch this program. And if maybe a way of concluding is if, if you wanted to speak to any Jehovah Witnesses who are watching tonight, what would you say to them to help them understand why they need to make the same journey home that you did? I would tell them that by becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses, in many respects, you're settling for much less than what the Lord wants to give you. Uh, there's a scripture that was quoted to me very often when I was uh, becoming a Jehovah's Witness, actually, and that was that anyone who gives up father and mother for following Christ will get these plus a whole yeah. lot more. Yeah. Um, that truth is, is very, very prominent in the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, you have Jesus, you have his mother, whom he gives us, and you have all his brothers and sisters who are the saints. And if you really want to live in a new heavens and a new earth, the authentic new heavens and new earth are what the Catholic Church offers people every day when you go to Mass in many respects. Um, I spent years believing and looking for a parousia, and the Jehovah's Witnesses know what I'm talking about when we talk about the parousia and believing that we live in the time of Christ's presence. Not realizing that if you want to experience an authentic parousia that's not based on pyramids, go to a Catholic church because you'll experience every Sunday in the Mass. <laughs> Jeff, thank you very much for joining us in the Journey Home. It's a great pleasure Thanks to have you with you. And, and just to let those of you at home know, one of the reasons that uh, Dr. Schwem is here is that uh, we're here tomorrow morning taping another round table, uh, this time with Jehovah Witnesses, uh, former Jehovah Witnesses. And I hope you've enjoyed the round table programs that are broadcast once a month on a Saturday night. Uh, and hopefully in the end we'll have 10 or 12 roundtable collections, each dealing with the essentials of different of the Protestant groups and their history and the main tenets and why they need to consider the fullness of the Catholic Church. So Dr. Schwimm, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure to be with you. We're on this journey together, you and I, following Jesus Christ by the power of Spirit guided by Him in our life to seek to follow Him faithfully. God bless you. See you next week.